right, I see people joining. <clears throat> um, uh, I think we can get started. So welcome everyone to today's weekly research conference. Um, as usual, please submit your questions using the Q&A feature, uh, not the chat. Uh, they'll be answered at the end of the presentation. Uh, we will also be able to accept live questions at the end of the presentation. So use the hands up feature uh, if you'd like to ask your question in, in this way, and then uh, we'll ask you to unmute. Un unmute. Um, uh, if you're experiencing tickle, technical difficulties, please use the chat feature. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Ben Rothstein. Um, ben is uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Biochemistry, uh, Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Ottawa. Uh, and he's director of the Molecular Imaging Probes and Radiochemistry Lab at uh, the Heart Institute. Um, he got his BSc in Dalhousie uh, and his PhD in organic chemistry at University of Toronto. He had a doctoral thesis um, that followed focusing on ma um, macrocyclization of peptides. And he then undertook postdoctoral training uh, in radiochemistry and molecular imaging at Harvard Medical School of Mass General. He was actually promoted to faculty uh, there in 2015. Uh, he, um, during his postdoctoral work, he discovered new methods for radiofluorination and contributed to new enzyme and receptor tracers for PET imaging. Um, his previous training was supported by NSERC um, in the form of postgraduate scholarships and fellowships. Uh, he's received the Young Investigator Award for the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging, as well as the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation Award. Um, he's also received an um, early research, researcher award from the Ministry of Research and Innovation and Science uh, from Ontario. Um, he served on grant panels for, for the Canadian Institute for Mental Health Research, uh, among others, and he's held leadership positions in the Society of Radio Pharmaceutical Sciences. Um, <clears throat> his research has been funded by CHR, Heart and Stroke Foundation, uh, the Canadian Arrhythmia Network, uh, through CIHR, the CFI, NSERC, uh, and the Ministry of Research, Innovation, and Science. In addition to the Heart Institute and the University of Ottawa Faculty of Medicine, he's uh, cross-appointed in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Ottawa uh, and the Institute of Mental Health Research at the Royal Ottawa Hospital. His research is in um, molecular imaging probes and the radiochemistry lab is directed towards the discovery of uh, new rate of pharmaceuticals for studying the biochemical and pharmaceutical mechanisms uh, of living systems and diagnosis of disease uh, disease conditions. The specific, um, specifically, he's interested in cardiovascular imaging targets, including ones relevant to atherosclerosis, arrhythmia, valve disease, and heart failure. And he's collaborating with many um, individuals uh, within the Institute uh, and beyond. Um, his lab also has developed innovative chemical methods for a small mo um, molecule Bioconjugation, bioconjugation of short-lived radioisotope, uh, uh, including carbon-11 and F18. Um, so his presentation today will be on chemical labeling of carbon-11 carbon dioxide, and I'll pass it now over to Ben. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, so the title for the talk today is Chemical Labeling with Carbon-11 Carbon Dioxide. Um, so last time I spoke in this series was about two years ago, and we talked about some of our tracer development programs going on in the lab. Uh, today we're going to talk about the other side, uh, which hopefully is still of interest uh, to, to this audience, uh, but it's much more the, the, the chemistry side of the lab where we're developing new methodologies. And I hope to convince you that those are essential to, uh, to drive uh, the imaging that we do, uh, both new tracer development and with clinical imaging. So uh, an overview of what the lab does. Uh, we make radio tracers, both new and existing ones. So there's some synthetic work that goes into this. Uh, and we like to design them so that they're targeted very selectively towards uh, certain biological targets uh, that might be indicative of a given disease. So one uh, major point of emphasis for the lab is imaging inflammation in atherosclerosis. So here's some data. Uh, showing uh, different strategies for matrix metalloproteinase imaging in atherosclerosis. And this is in mice. Uh, 
controls and, and diseased mice and showing the specificity and selectivity of the signal. Um, this is all done on, on tissue. Uh, there's also some in vivo work, uh, but it's difficult to image mouse aortas in vivo. Here's some dynamic and, uh, and in vivo imaging in rats for the myocardium. So this is sympathetic nervous system imaging uh, with the tracer we're developing. Um, and I'm not gonna talk about this today, uh, but we can see we do uh, dynamic, these are time activity curves and we do kinetic analyses on these to try to understand what's going on under pharmacological challenges and also uh, some denervation models. So we're imaging uh, the sympathetic nervous system here. So I won't talk about this today, uh, but I will be talking about this on Thursday at noon at the cardiac imaging rounds. Uh, so if you're interested, tune in for that as well. So all of this depends on uh, basically three things coming together. The first is expertise in synthetic organic chemistry. Uh, and that is used to incorporate radionuclides into small molecules. The second is understanding of what the biochemistry is that we actually want to image and why it's relevant. And then the third is being able to conduct these in vivo studies. Uh, so what we, the, the images that you're seeing on the slide are all generated by radionuclides. So what happens is, is that we incorporate a radionuclide into typically a small molecule, but it can be larger, it can be a peptide or a biomolecule, even an antibody uh, are very popular now. Uh, so we figure out ways that we can covalently attach these radionuclides into our molecules. The molecules will then accumulate within the body uh, based on the distribution and concentration of its target. And then as that radionuclide decays, we're able to visualize where it was. And that can tell us quantitatively um, what the concentration of that target is, maybe what the activity of that target is, all depending on how the probe was developed. So really, uh, of course, the technology depends on a lot of different factors coming together, but the one that we focus a lot on is how do we actually design these molecules and how do we get the radionuclides onto them? And those are different challenges uh, and interesting ones for us. So what we're going to talk about today is really this first step, not so much the actual imaging, uh, but rather how do we get radionuclides onto small molecules, and then why do we do it? Okay, so a bit of an introduction just to radiochemical methods. The Heart Institute is actually the designated site for uh, medical radiochemistry research in Ottawa, uh, at least academic medical radiochemistry. Um, but I appreciate that a lot of the audience may not have a lot of familiarity with the hows and the whys of, of this field. So essentially what a, a radionuclide is, is it's an unstable atom. So these are atoms like others uh, that uh, there may be stable isotopes of them, but we're talking about ones that are, are fairly short-lived. So they typically will have a half-life of minutes to hours. And for PET, what we're talking about are nuclides that decay by giving off a particle called a positron. Uh, and this positron then further decays to give us photons that we actually use for imaging. Within PET radionuclides, I've shown kind of a selective periodic table here on the right. Uh, and these are all um, elements that have isotopes that are useful for medical imaging. Most of these are PET, some of them are not. Um, and there's many more that I haven't shown. Uh, and I've kind of broken them up into a few different groups. We have some metals here, we have some main group elements and some halides. And for PET radiochemistry, really the bulk of the work is with these main group elements. And that's not an accident. Uh, they happen to have good imaging properties, but really the, the key is that these elements are the ones that also make up all of our biomolecules and most drugs uh, will contain all, some or all of these elements. So carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, these really make up the bulk of um, where PET radiochemistry is coming from uh, and probably where it's going in the future as well. It's also convenient because these elements are also the focus for organic chemistry because uh, we're mimicking um, you know, biological chemistry. So we've developed a lot of excellent tools for working with each of these elements. We understand their reactivity uh, and we're able to build up complex molecules using these. So the challenge comes in when we're doing radiochemistry, uh, we have access to each of those nuclides, but we have access to them in very simple forms. Uh, 
So typically we're talking about elemental oxides or hydrides. So for nitrogen, we're talking about ammonia or nitrates. For oxygen, we're typically talking about water. And for fluorine, we're talking about fluoride. For carbon, we're restricted to C1 units, okay? So we're talking about carbon dioxide or methane. So these are, are uh, molecules that have one carbon in them. And so therefore they're not that complex. I mean, structurally they're, they're quite uh, small and, and simple. And we can't do nuclear chemistry where we simply create the radionuclide in a complex molecule just because of the energies involved in that process. So why should we develop radiochemical methods? Because we need to take these simple things and turn them into things of great complexity uh, within all the restrictions of uh, what the nuclides can handle. So just to illustrate this with a real world example, uh, likely the most um, you know, practical uh, application of nuclear imaging has been perfusion imaging. And this has a very long history. Uh, so dating back to the 1920s, at least, uh, when Hermann Bloomgard was using something called, that he called radium C, we now know of as bismuth 214, uh, to measure transit times across the heart and across the lungs. Since then, we've come a long way, and it has not been, you know, a, a jump right into modern technology, of course. So in the 50s, we got ammonia online, this is still an excellent tracer that we use today. Uh, and then later on in the 70s, we have access to thallium and then water. And this is all developing because we have new technologies for producing radionuclides and, and ancillary technology. So new imaging cameras, uh, generator technologies, in fact, entirely new elements. So technetium came online in the 80s. And this has been a really dominant uh, way of doing perfusion imaging with the MIBI compounds and tetraphosmin. And now we're getting to much more complex, structurally complex molecules like tuberoxin. New generator technologies at the Heart Institute, we know rubidium chloride very well. And also structurally complex small organic molecules like fluorpyridine, as that now this is molecularly targeted. So the rest of these are crossing a membrane and being retained in cells based on blood flow. But fluorpyridase is actually targeted to a, a mitochondrial complex. So we're, we're changing the game here. And similarly, targeted to the mitochondrial membrane. Uh, maybe in the future, we'll have these um, uh, tetrasubstituted phosphonium compounds. So, as we've developed the technologies, we've seen increased structural complexity, and we've needed better techniques in order to manufacture these and, uh, and to be able to work with them. So, we couldn't have made molecules like this 30 years ago. Um, we wouldn't have known about molecules like this uh, much longer ago. Uh, so there is this tendency towards uh, more precise radiopharmaceuticals and therefore more structurally complex radiopharmaceuticals. And that's uh, not complexity for its own sake, and it's not me too drugs. These are actually improvements in increasing the utility or the access to radiopharmaceuticals. So that's why we develop radiochemical methods, is because there's a demand for them and we can improve care uh, by doing this. Okay, so I'm gonna focus on a radionuclide uh, called carbon-11. And so it is a, a rather short-lived uh, isotope of carbon. Carbon, as we all know, is, is the building block for all organic life. Uh, it's not organic if it's not carbon. Uh, carbon-11 has fairly, uh, very appealing properties for imaging. It's a pure positron emitter, essentially. It has a relatively low um, positron energy which means that we can generate relatively high resolution images from them compared to a lot of other nuclides. We also have a very efficient production method from uh, abundant nitrogen 14 on a cyclotron, such as the one that we have at the Heart Institute, and it's useful for PET, uh, which is uh, kind of the, the top uh, nuclear imaging modality right now. So what happens with carbon-11 is as it decays, it gives off this positron, uh, because the positron is relatively low energy, it's not going to travel very far from its parent nucleus or the molecule that it came from, and it's going to give off these gamma photons that we can then image. The half-life is on the short side. Um, that uh, may be considered a limitation, and that's why often I get asked, why work with carbon-11? Why not work with fluorine-18? And fluorine 18 uh, has nearly ideal properties. So it's a bit of a longer half-life. So you have a bit more time for manufacturing, distribution, uh, and imaging. The positron energy is even lower. And there have been major advances in late-stage radio labeling over the last 10 years. 
F18 is excellent. It can't do everything though. So fluorine is not abundant in uh, natural products or biomolecules at all. There's about six molecules that have been found in uh, living uh, organisms that contain fluorine. So we have to introduce it separately. And also maybe this half-life uh, advantage is not going to amount to as much as we improve our imaging technologies in the future. So um, I was at a conference last week, virtually of course, and, uh, and we were talking about uh, whole body PET. So this is your standard PET scanner, which has a field of view of 15 to 30 centimeters, which means that if you wanna do whole body imaging, you have continuous motion of multiple PET positions. It means you can't do dynamic imaging of the whole body. Also, the, the photons are not all going to interact with these detectors. So our sensitivity is relatively low here. It's still among the best, but our sensitivity is about one to 2%. So it's still very good uh, in terms of uh, nuclear imaging, but it's not as high as it obviously could be. So what Total Body Pet does is it essentially makes a much longer scanner. And there's not very many of these available. There are two outside of China and maybe five inside of China right now. Uh, so these are, are really just uh, coming online now. They have a much longer field of view, axial field of view, uh, that can cover the whole body, meaning we can do dynamic whole body imaging. But one advantage that maybe is not readily appreciated is that the sensitivity goes way up. So it hasn't been rigorously measured yet, um, but the estimation is about a 40-fold improvement in sensitivity over our standard PET scanners. They also have similar spatial resolution um, to, uh, to existing scanners. And this is the spatial resolution we can expect uh, with, uh, with PET, uh, millimeters, sorry. So um, yeah, so if we have this great advantage in sensitivity, then maybe the advantage in half-life doesn't matter so much because we can image with less isotope. So as, if we require less isotope to be, in, to be administered to the patient, that's not only safer for the patient, but it also means uh, that we can image much faster and we can image for longer times with a shorter lived nuclide like carbon 11. So suddenly the flexibility of the chemistry around carbon 11 maybe becomes a lot more appealing if we don't have to worry about that short half-life. There's also advantages in terms of throughput with carbon 11. So suppose we want to design imaging studies that use more than one radio tracer. With fluorine 18, due to the longer half-life, those are, going to be half, those are going to be separated by at least a day. You know, the, the first tracer is going to have to decay, and then we can go on with the second one. With carbon-11 or shorter-lived nuclides like nitrogen-13, maybe we're not restricted that way. Maybe we can do, and we do already do this, uh, multiple scans in the same patient in one day, and because we're doing lower dose imaging with our higher sensitivity, we're not concerned as much with dosimetry. So I do believe that the future for carbon-11 is very bright, and we're going to see uh, more demand for C11 tracers as we get to more multi-tracer studies in the future. Okay, so what's done right now with carbon-11? These are all uh, rather important radio tracers that are used uh, and manufactured from carbon-11 that contain carbon-11. So at uh, the Royal, uh, we're using raclopride to stridal D2 receptors in the brain. Uh, this is a methyl phenol or a methyl ether. Uh, we use PIBD image beta amyloid plaques uh, in the brain, but also now uh, there's some research in the heart for um, cardiovascular amyloidosis. Uh, again, this is a, a methylamine. For uh, imaging gliomas especially, methionine is much superior to F2G because of lower uh, background uptake in the brain. This is a methyl sulfide. We can image the dopamine transporter using P2I. This is a methyl ester. Uh, at the Heart Institute, we use this tracer quite a bit. This is metahydroxyephedrine. Uh, so this also images sympathetic nerve terminals. And this is again, another methylamine. We can use choline chloride to image choline phosphorylation and metabolism, uh, useful for prostate cancer imaging. Uh, this is a methyl ammonium salt. We can use DASB for serotonin transporter imaging. Uh, many important studies in major depression using DASB. This was developed out of Toronto and Cambridge. Another methylamine and flumazenil that has also been used at the Royal uh, for imaging um, central GABA receptors. And this is a methyl amine. So these are all, I'm going to argue, structurally fairly similar. They all contain these methyl groups. They're all very important radio tracers and they're all um, made in very efficient ways. How they are made, we start with CO2 from the cyclotron, 
we convert that through methane to something like methyl iodide or methyl triflate, and then we react them with a, a desmethyl precursor. So essentially, imagine each one of these compounds without the blue group on there. And then we can produce these methyl, methylated products. So I'm going to argue that that is um, very effective, but it also is very limited because it means that we have to build in these methyl positions. And we know that those are not very common in drugs. So a um, uh, survey of pharmaceutical companies have found that approximately like one eighth of their uh, lead molecules contain a methyl group. What else can we label with C11 that's not a methyl group? That's the challenge my lab is facing. One thing that we've been doing for a long time <clears throat> is labeling carboxylic acids. So for example, using carbon dioxide <clears throat> directly with uh, these uh, methylated Grignard reagents, uh, we can produce acetate, and that's very useful for imaging oxidative metabolism. Using copper catalysis and boronic esters, we can also produce some aryl uh, uh, carboxylic acids, some benzoic acids, and there's some recent developments using these uh, silylated precursors, again, to create carboxylic acids. Carboxylic acids are interesting. They're not that common uh, in, in drugs. They are fairly common in biomolecules like amino acids. Uh, to make derivatives of these that are perhaps more interesting requires uh, rather complex multi-step synthesis. So this is a tracer called PHNO, uh, another one developed out of CAMH in Toronto by Alan Wilson. Uh, so this is a propylamine, uh, and this requires about five steps from CO2 uh, to make a carboxylic acid, an acid chloride, and then an amide, and then uh, the amine uh, by reduction. So this is very challenging, very complex, not going to be easy to disseminate this. Uh, this is useful for imaging D2 and D3 receptors uh, in the striatum and outside of the striatum. Another molecule, this is uh, an opioid antagonist. Uh, it was uh, uh, kind of a failed radio tracer, but they tried to make an amide from these carboxylic acids. And again, it requires multiple steps and rather complex chemistry that's low yielding. So there's desire to make these kind of amides that we see here and products of amides here, uh, but the methods to make them right now are limited. And that's really what we set out to do with uh, our NSERC discovery program. Uh, was to find a way to make these amides. These are, this is the uh, you know, prototypical functional group of an amide. Uh, and we want to make these efficiently with carbon-11 from CO2. So amides are very, very common functional groups. Uh, uh, a survey of pharmaceutical companies found that actually approximately one in every six reactions run in a pharmaceutical company makes an amide. Okay. This is a huge number, over half, approximately 55% of all lead compounds uh, in pharmaceuticals contain at least one amide. So these are, are very, very common linkages. This is the backbone of peptides, and many, many biomolecules. Okay, so if we want to make amides, there's, there's obviously very good methods to do these uh, with stable isotopes. And the way that these work is by acylation of an amine. So this bond here is the one that is formed to make an amide. If we're dealing with C11 and we have a C1 unit, we have to form that bond, but we also have to form this carbon-carbon bond on the other side. So we believe that this carbon-nitrogen bond is not as much of a challenge, but this carbon-carbon bond formation, there's actually very few uh, methods available in the conventional literature to make this type of carbon-carbon bond. So that's kind of the challenge we set out for ourselves is developing chemistry specific for carbon-11. And we thought to do it first with the nitrogen carbon bond formation, so the opposite of what I showed you on the last slide, and that's by a functional group called the isocyanate or an equivalent of these. So here's uh, the first strategy we came up with. We can take an amine, react that with CO2 to produce this ionic carbamate, and then by some conditions that were already uh, present in the literature, uh, we form this isocyanate. This is a dehydration reaction to form our isocyanate. And then we know from the literature that, uh, and this is stuff that was developed around 2010, uh, that we could react these with amines or alcohols and create ureas or carbamates. So can we take these isocyanates, and instead of making these more oxidized functional groups, can we make amides, which are uh, maybe more attractive uh, and more common in um, 
biological chemistry. Okay, so this was uh, the first mission. So the first approach we took to this was using um, methylated nucleophiles. So we're talking about organozinc halides, and we're trying to couple these with isocyanates. This was informed heavily by the literature choosing organozincs. Uh, we liked organozinc because they are, uh, they've been shown to be reactive with highly activated isocyanates by Paul Michel in France. Um, there was some uh, evidence for catalysis using a certain organozinc, bis iodozinc methane by Matsubara. And then uh, some other reagents actually could undergo non catalyzed reactions. They're called reefer Matsky reagents, which you can think of as organozinc esters. Um, and this was shown by, by a group in uh, also fairly recently. So we want to take the isocyanate and we want to form the amide. And we're concerned about the potential side products, those being carbamate or urea. So we're concerned about ureas because we know that the background reaction of all isocyanates, these are fairly unstable. If they see some water, they're going to hydrolyze and eventually form these ureas. And this is irreversible. And we don't want uh, to be making ureas because we have good methods to make those already. And we were a little bit concerned from the literature because it seemed like these carbamates were actually a major byproduct uh, whenever this group used uh, basically reagents that were a little bit less engineered than the Reformatsky style ones. And this is presumably, it's a bit surprising that these would be formed, but they're presumably formed by oxidation uh, by some trace levels of air uh, present in the reaction mixture. And we, we need to have conditions that are going to be able to tolerate exposure to air. So I'm summarizing a lot of work in a three line table here, but essentially we took uh, phenyl zinc iodide and phenyl isocyanate and we screened very many conditions, uh, different catalysts and solvents. And we find that indeed under the non-catalyzed conditions, we form primarily the carbamate, which again, a little bit surprising, probably worth following up on, uh, but not the focus of, of this project. Using a very common transition metal cat catalyst, uh, palladium acetate, we see no reactivity in fact. And then when we switch to rhodium, we're able to get high selectivity for the amide uh, with some background reaction to form the urea. This is very promising. And these conditions were uh, developed a bit more rigorously by the students in my lab. And in the event, uh, we came up with a new methodology for conventional chemistry. So this is all stable isotope chemistry here, uh, where we're using phenyl zinc iodide and reacting it with a number of different isocyanates. And we can see that the yields, they do vary, especially when we have electron rich isocyanates uh, uh, or some uh, alkyl isocyanates. But in general, these are you know, moderate to good yields. We can also, the, uh, the attraction of the organizings is we can have functionalized molecules. And indeed we have uh, ethers and ketones and esters and a few other, and halides, some other functional groups. And these tend to be very well tolerated by the chemistry as well. We can also use some aliphatic um, organozincs with uh, a, a general loss in, in yield, but still useful levels. Okay, we're not that interested in conventional chemistry. Um, there are better ways to make amides. I wouldn't really use that organic zinc method, uh, but it's a staging ground. And so now we switch to CO2. So, or we, we switch to carbon 11. And with carbon 11, we start with CO2. So we don't start with the isocyanate itself. We have to make that isocyanate in situ. And then because we're very limited in half-life, we want to directly engage in that coupling uh, to form our, our amide products. So I showed you there were two pathways that had been developed previously. We could do a dehydration with highly acidic phosphoryl chloride, and that gets us strong yields of the isocyanate. Uh, or we could do a dehydration with, with what I'm just going to call Mitsunobu conditions or Mitsunobu reagents, uh, which is a sacrificial azo compound and a phosphine. And these will also give us isocyanates. And, and both methods work well in our lab. But for the coupling, uh, unsurprisingly, perhaps, uh, the phosphoryl chloride method is not tolerated. We saw no amide and no trapping because of the highly acidic conditions here. Under the more basic conditions, we actually see very high trapping efficiency and very high radiochemical yield in order to form these amides. Braden is the one who led the, uh, uh, the automation and following through on this project. So just to give you a scope of how this works, this is some CFI funded uh, instrumentation that we're using. Uh, this sits inside of a hot cell and it conducts everything from trapping CO2 from the cyclotron. We deliver that into a vial containing a precursor. We mix in reagents in sequence, and then we transfer it over to our organozinc in a secondary reactor. This is all in the same instrument. We quench it, and then we purify it, collect the product, and analyze it. 
So it's all controlled remotely by a laptop and uh, Britain created this nice illustration that I think uh, shows how it works very well. So here's the scope we came up with. Uh, these molecules work at variable levels. So we have uh, some biologically relevant molecules like acid analyte and pyruvamide. And this N-acetylglutamic acid, we're very interested in uh, amino acids. Uh, so we, we're always looking for methods in, uh, to enable radio labeling here. Uh, and then some other molecules that are kind of just show pieces for understanding how the chemistry works. So these work in invariable yields. Uh, they do uh, tend to work. It's, it's, uh, it's rather practical. So here's an example where we're actually isolating the product. We get very high purity product, very high quality, good radiochemical yield, uh, and very fast. So this meets all the requirements for uh, a radiochemical method. The limitation I'd say is that these fun the, the functional groups we're able to include here are all not that exciting. Okay, so we don't have anything heterocyclic. We don't have anything strongly basic. And that comes down to, we believe, uh, the catalyst that we've chosen and the organo sinks that we use are simply not as functionally group tolerant as we'd like them to be. So while this is a useful method for making molecules of the type I'm showing here, it's still fairly limited. And we'd like to find conditions similarly using the same strategy uh, that might be more robust. And so that's where a co-op student joined our lab shortly before the pandemic hit, uh, Chirbo Nakesa, and she's still kind of helping us out and, and working on uh, developing more robust methods using the strategy that Braden kind of proved to be effective. So we switched from organozincs, which are um, kind of uh, not the most fun thing to work with, to something that's more bench stable, like uh, baronic esters. And we switched away from rhodium, which is very uh, air and moisture sensitive to something much more robust like copper. And what Chirbo does is, is after, again, I'm summarizing a lot on just one slide here, but after some discovery work, uh, she developed conditions using this copper catalyst and a fluoride additive in order to uh, conduct the reaction you're seeing on top here, which is a coupling of an isocyanate and an amide. And again, this is stable isotope chemistry. And so we don't want to fall into the same pitfalls, so we, we kind of uh, reversed the development process here. So what happened here is rather than now go and translate this for C11 and see what the scope is, uh, we went directly towards the scope. So um, we don't want to try to make all these different molecules because that's very time consuming. So rather we simply do what's called a robustness assay. We add in complex molecules that we might want to synthesize by this method and we see if those interfere with the catalyst or interfere with the reaction itself. And I, I think this is a, an exciting way to do chemistry discovery, uh, and we're hoping that this is gonna work out and then deliver an effective method for us. And we can see that for the most part, uh, this chemistry is much more uh, robust, much more tolerant of functional groups than the rhodium catalyzed zinc method. There are still some limitations. So very electron rich heterocycles uh, remain a limitation. Uh, highly acidic compounds remain a limitation and even some small, uh, highly basic compounds like cyclohexylamine that we wish we could work with uh, may not work all that well for us. Some interesting phenomena here. These are two very, very similar molecules. The only difference is the backbone in phenanthrolin is constrained. So we think this actually might be a good strategy for ligand discovery for this reaction. We were concerned though, because we need these Mitsunobu reagents again uh, in order to conduct the dehydration and make the isocyanate. And we found that our standard conditions were not at all tolerated by the copper. So this is a problem, and this is one that Cherubo is still working on to try to solve. We have made some headway where uh, using slightly milder reagents, we're able to rescue some of the reactivity, uh, but now we're going to try out and see how well these are, um, these are gonna perform uh, with C11, and hopefully we have something that's uh, a similar strategy, but much more robust in our hands. So what this kind of alerted us to is that um, you know, we, we think about this as a one pot process where we form the isocyanate and then conduct the coupling, but really maybe these dehydration conditions that we're relying on, they may not be, uh, they may not be the best, they may not be compatible with all sorts of, uh, of downstream coupling chemistry that we're developing. So maybe we have to go back and think about how do we actually make our isocyanates. And it just so happens that um, we had another project uh, that, was work that was studying this at the same time. So for this, um, instead of starting with an amine and then dehydrating with triphenylphosphine and the nasal reagent, we kind of built 
all that reactivity into one precursor molecule. And this is called an aminophosphorane. And aminophosphorines have been known for quite some time, but they're very uh, understudied, I'd say, even in the conventional literature. There's only a handful that have ever been made. And uh, because they're quite reactive, uh, not in an unsafe way at all, but they're, they're fairly understudied, I'd say. So uh, what is known about aminophosphorines is that they react with CO2 and they react with CO2 directly to give us the isocyanate. So no need for additional additives. We simply build in all of our reactivity into the precursor molecule. The challenge is, is because aminophosphorines are still reactive, the isocyanate is uh, even more reactive than CO2. So we end up forming a large amount of these symmetrical byproducts. So the challenge for us was how do we develop a method in order to kind of intercept this intermediate uh, and divert that towards an amide rather than forming these symmetrical byproducts that are of little interest. We're not the only ones who are thinking this way. So uh, a researcher in France, David Odicio, was kind of working on a similar strategy at the same time. So in his work, he starts with uh, an azide molecule, an, an amino azide. So this is a molecule that's built to kind of trap CO2 within itself. And he reacts that azide with an electron-rich phosphine uh, in situ to form the aminophosphorane, adds the CO2, and is able to do labeling with carbon-13 and carbon-11 uh, to form these urea heterocycles. So a similar strategy. Um, we did not want to be limited to cyclic molecules. And I'm also concerned about working with azides within um, a ready pharmaceutical environment, because azides are known to be uh, just a little bit explosive. So we prefer not to go that route. So instead, we build up our uh, aminophosphorine uh, beforehand, and we're able to show that we can react that with CO2, produce the isocyanate, and then in the presence of uh, a separate nucleophile, so this is intermolecular now as opposed to intramolecular, we are able to form these linear products of the type here. So starting with uh, phenylaminophosphorine, we can react these with alcohols, a variety of alcohols to, to make carbamates. We can react them with uh, thiolates to make uh, thiocarbamates. We can react them with amines to make ureas, or we can even react them with malinates to create these uh, triacyl methine type compounds. Uzera, the student leading this project, uh, was very perceptive that some of these molecules may actually be reactive as isocyanates themselves. If we heat them a little bit, they'll undergo an elimination reaction. And indeed, then we can add a secondary nucleophile, a methylated nucleophile in this case, uh, such as a green yard or an organic cuprate, and we're able to form amides uh, in a one pot process from our aminophosphorane and CO2. Uzer also took on uh, the rather challenging task of making a number of uh, highly functionalized aminophosphoranes, and these have uh, variable reactivity that would kind of fit the trends we expect. Um, but in general, the, they form, uh, they're able to undergo these reactions in, in very good yields. So some that I'll highlight are melatonin here, uh, this protected phenylalanine. And again, I told you we're interested in amino acids. And then regorafenib, uh, which is an oral kinase inhibitor. Okay, again, uh, that's the conventional chemistry. We want to work with the C11. The selectivity for isocyanate is much more challenging with C11. So typically, we're working with very low levels of CO2 which means that we're going to have very high excess of an aminophosphorane. In the conventional chemistry, we're able to saturate all of the aminophosphorines with CO2, so we don't have as much problem of the symmetrical byproducts. With carbon-11, that's not possible because we have less than a nanomole of CO2. We're always gonna have some excess of aminophosphorine if we have some appreciable concentration of it. So Uzer uh, went about adjusting the stoichiometry, playing with uh, different reaction conditions. And in the event, he found that actually uh, kind of counterintuitively, but reducing the amount of base, this amidine-based DBU, uh, unlocked high selectivity to form uh, these non-symmetrical products, also increasing the concentration of our nucleophile. Uh, so here's the scope that Uzer generated, many similar compounds to the ones I showed you on the last slide, but I'll highlight the last three here. This is an experimental antiarrhythmic compound that also has some uh, glucose cerebrosibase uh, uh, inhibition activity. This is CURB, which is a molecule I used to work with uh, at MGH. Uh, it's a fatty acid amidhydrolase inhibitor. Fatty acid amidhydrolase is what controls anandamide levels and cannabinoid signaling in the brain and in the periphery, in fact. Um, so this is actually a very interesting compound to study addictions. It's a clinically used ready pharmaceutical. 
Uh, and then also glabenclamide. And this is kind of an interesting molecule. So we hadn't really thought about functional groups like this before, these sulfonyl ureas. Uh, but we did come across some literature where people were using this glabenclamide, which is actually an anti-diabetes drug. Uh, it binds to the SIR1 receptor in beta cells in the pancreas. Uh, so people had radiolabeled it before at the methyl position. So methylation is easy, right? Well, not so. In fact, this required a two-step synthesis where they had to build up the molecule after methylation uh, and resulted in rather low yields, so about 5% overall yield from, uh, from methyl triflate, in fact. Um, so Uzer's method uh, beats that out of the water very easily. So he's able to isolate a 62% yield of this with high molar activity and doing this in about 20 minutes. Uh, so we're very excited about this method. Uh, it unlocks a new functional group that we hadn't really thought of before. And in fact, uh, some good does come out of COVID. So uh, sometime last spring, while I was sitting at home pondering, you know, uh, doomsday and, and such things, uh, I came across this magazine that, you know, I had delivered weekly, this chemical and engineering news. And it showed this really cool structure that's kind of like, looks like a macrame propeller to me. Uh, and this is an inflammasome, and I, I didn't really know all that much about inflammasomes. Uh, but I got to reading about them and these NLRP3 inflammasomes specifically, these take in signals from IL-1 receptors or toll-like receptors, as well as uh, mitochondrial ROS production. And what they do is they, uh, they cause expression of NLRP3 and these caspase templating um, molecules, and they, they form these large macromolecules Call these inflammasomes, these NLRP3 inflammasomes, and these unlock caspase activity uh, to, um, to, to, uh, to act on IL-1 beta and release IL-1 beta to propagate inflammation. So this is uh, you know, one drug to cure them all, kind of Lord of the Rings thing, uh, but it's been implicated in sterile inflammation, atherosclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, neurodegeneration. There's a lot of excitement, and they, they had a, a full page listed of startups that have been making uh, trying to make NLRP3 inhibitors. And so there was only one structure shown in the article, and that was this, it's MCC950. Okay, so this is developed at a University of Queensland, looks rather exciting, and what do you know, it contains a sulfonyl urea. So it was uh, the beginning of the pandemic shutdown, so I hopped on my new Microsoft Teams account, and I sent this to Uzair, and I asked Uzair, hey, can we radio label this? And Uzair said, yeah, of course we can. So we ordered the starting materials, and indeed, we managed to radio label it. We were not the first, though, because my, my friend and mentor, actually, Peter Scott in Michigan, was working with the people at Queensland already. And they had already radio labeled MCC 950. They had the same idea we did. They used older chemistry. And uh, their method was actually quite challenging. So they had to add in additional carbon dioxide to get the reaction to proceed. And they end up with a, a rather modest yield. Uh, approximately 1% and low molar activity of the product, but they were able to make MCC 950. Uzair was not deterred. He made MCC 950 uh, from the aminophosphorine. So using our new method with CO2, and we're able to produce them a very high yield, so 72% yield, and very high molar activity. So now we have access to this new exciting NLRP3 inhibitor. Uh, we decided to start some imaging studies in it. So these are two mice, a C57 black six mouse and an APOE knockout mouse. And uh, we can see that the images, well, there's a lot of liver uptake. So they look essentially the same. These are the time activity curves. Again, not much uh, to look at. Uh, the APOE mouse uh, has some plaques in their aorta. So we took those out and we imaged those by autoradiography. What do you know? There is quite a bit higher uptake in the APOE mouse than in the C57 mouse. That's maybe not surprising. Uh, a lot of molecules will be taken up by these plaques, um, especially one that should be targeted to uh, an inflammation marker like an LRP3. Uh, so we've shown that these animals have the plaques, they have the, the markers of inflammation. And right now we're, we're still working on this to try to validate whether it's actually going to reflect NLRP3 uptake itself, or maybe an off target, or maybe it's simply nonspecific. Uh, but maybe could be a starting point for uh, trace development for inflammasome imaging. So we're fairly excited about this. So that project is really focused on how do we make better isocyanates, because all the coupling chemistry, all the carbon-carbon bond forming chemistry I showed you there, uh, was all already fairly well known. Uh, so finding ways for that to work together with aminophosphorines uh, was a challenge, and that's something that uh, Zero overcame. Uh, but I think we're starting to see how we can separate out 
uh, formation of a reactive intermediate like an isocyanate from coupling to make our products. Uh, and that's really what led to this next project. This is actually another uh, kind of happy story coming out of um, COVID and also uh, parental leave, uh, where I had a lot more time to correspond with uh, maybe some colleagues throughout Canada. And um, yeah, so we, I got to chatting with a, a researcher in Alberta named Rylan Lundgren, a chemist. We actually uh, both went to Dal together and overlapped a little bit. Uh, so what Rylan's really interested are these carbon isotope exchange chemistries. So he'll take some carboxylic acid, for example, and he'll find conditions to make carboxylic acids, except these carboxylic acids now are isotopically labeled. And he works with stable isotopes like C13. Um, but potentially the, the chemistry could translate to something uh, that's short-lived and uh, low concentration like C11. So we got to talking about it. And the way that uh, this method was, was designed is it takes advantage of something called photoredox catalysis. So essentially what happens is uh, we have a radical decarboxylation uh, to create this, uh, this carbon-based radical, an oxidation uh, to, uh, to produce this um, uh, carbon-based anion, and then a reaction with CO2 to regenerate the carboxylic acid. So it's not a totally reversible process because it goes through these intermediates and it's catalyzed by light, okay? So this is called a radical polar crossover. All the other reagents I've been showing you, so the organo zincs, the Greenyard reagents, even those malinates, they're really stand-ins for carbon-based anions. And it's surprising how even as mature as organic chemistry is, those are really the best approaches we've had until very recently for making carbon-based anions. This photoredox catalysis has become very popular in the last, I'd say, five to 10 years. It's been around for a little bit longer than that. Uh, but the advantage of it really is that it unlocks these type of anions that are only very transiently formed in this case, uh, but can be formed from much more complex molecules. So how does it work? So this is the photoredox catalyst uh, that people typically start with uh, when they're doing chemistry with carboxylic acids. So it's an aromatic ring surrounded by four carbazoles and two cyano groups. And what happens is if we subject this to a carboxylic acid, it will undergo decarboxylation. But in fact, the catalyst itself also degrades. And this is really what unlocked the chemistry for C11, as I'll show you on the next slide, where we form this other catalyst um, that normally you'd expect a degradation product to not be reactive, but this in fact is more reactive than the starting material. So here's the mechanism for those of you interested. You start with your stable photocatalyst. So this can be the molecule I'm showing at the top right. We expose it to blue light. It enters an excited state. It then takes a carboxylate and oxidizes it to, a carbon, uh, to an oxygen-based radical. That undergoes decarboxylation with a very low barrier to form the carbon-based radical. The catalyst itself then wants to turn over and it can reduce the carbon-based radical to the carbon-based anion. That reacts with CO2 and we create our carboxylate back again. So again, not a reversible process, but again, the starting material and the product are chemically identical. So Maxime, a postdoc in our lab, he led this project with C11, working hand in hand with the London Group in Alberta. Uh, so starting with um, uh, these kind of uh, NSAID type molecules, uh, we're able to show that in the presence of the photocatalyst and CO2, a little bit of base and blue LEDs, in only 10 minutes, we're able to get reasonable incorporation of carbon 11 into this molecule, okay? If we use the older catalyst instead of the degradation product, we see no reactivity. And if we have no catalyst and we just use thermal conditions instead of light, we get no reactivity at all either. So uh, Maxime was able to make a number of very interesting compounds. These are, are a bunch of NSAIDs here at, at top right. Uh, those are compounds that contain carboxylic acids, drugs that contain carboxylic acids. Uh, so rather interesting, uh, potentially have applications. I'd say we're a little bit more excited about these other uh, scaffolds. So these are malinates that we can produce now, and especially these protected amino acids uh, that get us very excited. So we'd love to be able to do more in this space. And in fact, we now do have uh, more updated methods that are going to give us access to a greater range of amino acids and better yields. 
This is also practical. So using uh, photochemistry within uh, a radiochemistry lab for production uh, can be a bit of a challenge because the instruments we have aren't built for this. Um, we were able to develop this using kind of a interfacing home designed instruments. Uh, and now we're actually getting help from the Beats Research Laboratory and uh, Emilio Alarcon uh, to use a flow-based photochemistry setup. And we're very excited about that. So we're able to get very high purity products isolated out of this um, in good yields. So uh, just to sum up kind of what the state of the art is with C11, uh, as we see it, uh, we do still believe that C11 is a great avenue for direct radio labeling of complex small molecules. But we do appreciate now that the chemical methods need to be designed specifically for C11, uh, and specifically that we need to separate out the development of methods for reactive intermediates, such as isocyanates, so CN bond formation, versus fixation, CC bond formation. They're discrete, they're distinct processes, they have to interface. So we need to have a toolbox of different conditions for doing this first step and for doing this second step uh, so that we can find ones that play well together. So we're not there yet. We've taken advantage of some uh, compelling strategies, preloaded reagents such as aminophosphorin and photoredox catalysis uh, that offer greater inroads for selectivity. Um, so we're improving on uh, just standard coupling methods. New radio labeling methods do drive the discovery of new imaging molecules. We're very excited about the molecules we have access to now uh, with some of these new methods, uh, but we do also appreciate that limitations still remain. So for example, all the amides I've shown you are in secondary amides. We'd love to be able to do things with tertiary amides. We've required protecting groups for several of the molecules. We'd love to be able to get away from that, and we think we can now. And we'd love to be able to work with more basic functional groups that are always gonna be a challenge uh, for organic chemistry methods. Okay, uh, I'd like to uh, especially acknowledge the group of, of trainees that have contributed to all this work. In particular, I've highlighted the work of Braden Mayer, Cherbo Nikesa, Maxime, Mustafa, and Uzair. Uh, David also worked on some tin chemistry that I have not shown you today. And uh, Miriam just joined the lab last week as an NSERC USRA student, and she's gonna help out with this as well. Uh, rylan has been instrumental to the photoredox catalysis work we've shown you. And uh, certainly this work would not be able to take place without the Pet Radio Chemistry Lab and Biomedical Engineering for keeping our cameras online, as well as funding from all of these different agencies. Thank you very much for your attention, uh, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Ben. <clears throat> uh, that was great. Um, uh, really uh, a lot of work going on, and uh, you know, I think uh, people don't appreciate the amount of work that goes into these uh, developing these new compounds. So we do appreciate uh, your leadership and all the work of your team uh, towards that. Um, I have um, a few questions um, while we wait for others to uh, chime in. Um, so um, the you did highlight the uh, sort of new uh, cameras, the full length uh, field of view and so on, and this potential um, to increase sensitivity, which would help uh, C11 chemistry and so on. Um, with these new methods with the, with, that you've described, um, is it likely that the specific activity as well will be increased? Um, do, we, do we know that? Or is that something you have to, uh, presumably have to determine with each particular molecule and so on, but will it yeah. generally yield higher specific activity? So. That's my first uh, of a couple of questions. Yeah, so specific activity, just, just to describe it for the audience, is essentially what is the uh, concentration of radioactive carbon to uh, all carbon? So um, some of our methods, such as the CIE, the chemical isotope exchange, they give low specific activity because we start with the same uh, molecule that we have in the product. Uh, so specific activity, is kind of a, a controversial topic in that mostly it depends on how powerful your cyclotron is and how much uh, radioactivity you produce on that cyclotron. So for some of our methods, the specific activity is, is kind of moderate, uh, but then if we, and that's because we work with low levels of activity just for our own safety. Uh, but if we start with more activity, we get higher specific activity and that's fine. And then the second point is really a lot of the debates about specific activity come from the neuroimaging space where we're focused on very low density receptors. 
And that's because if you have low specific activity, you may have saturation of those receptors and you have less signal coming from uh, the target. That's not the case for a lot of applications. And in fact, nowadays people are finding that in cancer imaging in particular, lower molar activity or specific activity can actually be advantageous, uh, especially for some of these theranostic probes. Um, so I think with respect to the new cameras, certainly if you're trying to image lower density targets, uh, like we would be able to with higher sensitivity, you're going to need higher specific activity. And that's something carbon 11 is very, very good at actually, because we're able to produce so much of it uh, we can produce very, very high specific activity carbon-11 if we have the right cyclotron. Uh, it really comes down to the application, so I try not to worry too much about specific activity. So for example, uh, if we're really interested in sugars or amino acids or other molecules, choline, that are high concentration in our bodies anyway, specific activity is essentially irrelevant because once it gets into the patient or the imaging subject, um, you know, it's diluted. Uh, into a huge mass anyway. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, uh, so I just remind people to use the question and answer um, uh, venue on their screen and or raise your hand if you have specific questions. Um, I, I will add to that and ask um, uh, if, you, if there are um, if the intermediary molecules or the molecules, or the uh, excuse me, the um, the the chemistry changes that are being implemented, um, are these um, uh, affecting the biological properties of the of the uh, of the molecule that you're trying to uh, label um, uh, with with the new techniques that you're developing? So. Um, hoping that there's minimal and then you know what's the what's the path to prove that and you know does would health canada be likely to accept for example that you've um you know done this chemistry to add this minor modification uh, are we likely to um, be able to get health canada approval for that type of compound or is it still going to require sort of rigorous um uh requirements um uh, for around uh, safety and toxicity, et cetera. Yeah, so the, the, the big advantage with carbon-11 is really that you don't have to change the structure of the molecule, right? So if we want to image with an amino acid, we can make the amino acid itself uh, with carbon-11. With fluorine-18, for example, there's a lot of excitement uh, right now over glutamine imaging, okay? So people are making these glutamine uh, amino acids that contain a fluorine somewhere on the side chain. And that's exciting. And, and they've taken a lot of time to try to get that right, uh, to find out which position, the stereochemistry of it, that's going to uh, give them the kind of activity, the biological activity uh, that they're looking for. Um, and that's been a big challenge. And so have they found the right one, potentially? Uh, if we're looking for something that's going to mimic glutamine, Carbon-11 is much more appealing that way because we can simply make glutamine itself. And then from a regulatory standpoint, yeah, I mean, there's, there's no questions about toxicity of uh, radio tracers in the concentration that we're giving them when they're already biological molecules or approved drugs. So we, we really do have an advantage that way where uh, there's a lot less concern over uh, you know, running your, your toxicity studies or your, your treatment studies. Um, that's, uh, that's something that, that we can do. Um, so in terms of like, what is the imaging performance of uh, a labeled molecule? I think it's really interesting with C11 because it really comes down to the position that is labeled, right? So uh, again, to go back to amino acids, because what I've been thinking about a lot lately, um, what's the metabolic pathway of each individual amino acid? So what is that going to look like within uh, a living cell? And how are we going to read out from that? So if we label, for example, on glutamine, if we label uh, the terminal amide, what happens there? Uh, if we label that with nitrogen 13, we know that that might undergo deamination and form glutamate and we might lose our signal, but maybe that's the process we wanna image. With our approach, we're labeling the alpha carboxylic acid uh, 
that we know is a site of metabolism. It under, those undergo decarboxylation, uh, but potentially that's the activity we want to study is what's the metabolic rate of consumption of these amino acids. If we're looking for something simply as, as uptake, maybe we want something that's retained. And again, that, that points out that you need more than one way to label a molecule because it, it depends on what your application really is. So yeah, I'd love to be able to say we can snap our fingers and label any position. Um, and you know, ideally one day we'll get there, but uh, right now it's about what molecules can we rate a label and how can we take advantage of those? All right, um, we've reached, uh, we're just past the hour. So uh, I think we'll, we'll call this to a close. I'm sorry that I consumed the question and answer period. I'm sure Ben, if people email him, can answer specific questions. Um, uh, congratulations, Ben, on, on this great work and, and that uh, um, uh, all, always encouraging that you have um, some bright fellows and trainees working with you, helping uh, to solve these problems. I, I think it's, it's, you really gave a, a nice overview, uh, understandable to us non-chemists uh, about what's uh, in the background around getting these uh, molecules made. And hopefully there'll be more, more to come. Um, that's going to help us uh, with our, both our fundamental science and clinical science uh, research to better understand disease and develop new new treatments. So thank you very much, um, Ben, and much, congratulations, and everyone have a have a great day. Thank you.